Um, so I just wanted to take a little bit of time just to reflect on the season that was uh, very briefly um, and just, I guess, in line with the theme for this particular updates for 2019, which is around boosting profitability through resilient solutions. So the season that was, I think um, everyone is, would, would agree that um, in simple terms it could be described as, as challenging, if not variable. So um, obviously we had uh, below average growing season rainfall across most of the GRDC southern region. Um, we were challenged by strong wind events um, early on during crop establishment, particularly having an effect on some of those sandier soil types in the Upper Air Peninsula as well as parts of, of the Mallee of South Australia and Victoria. Um, and I guess, once again, unfortunately, um, subject to numerous frost events, um, not just one, but several um, throughout the year, which had a devastating effect for some, but I guess um, somewhat offset um, in some cases by strong commodity pricing and particularly the demand for, for feed and fodder. Um, I guess, uh, unfortunately for the North, having a, a tough season, but um, you know, I guess some of the Southern region growers benefiting in terms of, of that demand for feed and fodder. Um, I guess it's always dangerous to generalise and, and last season was a case in point in terms of the variability that we saw. Um, you know, we, we had some growers that had their best season ever on the back of average yields um, or if not below average but uh, you know, reasonable, com reasonably high commodity prices um, to others that had one of their poorest seasons ever. So um, I guess once again just, just highlights the need to, to have resilient farm businesses which can deal with those seasonal uh, variabilities as well as um, other challenges around the broader farm business. So I think that these two maps maybe uh, tell the story of 2018 on the, uh, on the left hand side basically showing the rainfall desales here from March to November 2018. Um, and what you can see is, is most of the southern region, or most, most of the southern region in particular, uh, having very much below average rainfall. Um, it is important to note that I think a couple of timely, um, timely rainfall events um, in late spring did help to bring some areas home with a bit of a wet sail and did salvage the season, particularly in, in um, the southeast of SA and parts of maybe the central and, and lower air peninsula. Um, on the right hand side, um, I've just selected the, the, um, the minimum temperature desoles for the month of September. So just, just September, but I think what it shows is that basically we had very much below average or even in many cases lowest on record temperatures across the GOC southern region. Um, so obviously uh, showing those variabilities. So I guess it begs us to ask the question, um, you know, is variability the new norm? Um, you know, I've, I've focused, I guess, a bit here in terms of season 2018, um, but I did just pull a few, few uh, graphs off of the BOM um, website, and I will caveat this with I'm not a climatologist or an expert in, in weather, but I think just so showing some of the trends um, that are occurring. So um, apologies if those can't see up the back, but what we're looking at from left to right is basically trends in... Um, total uh, rainfall um, for uh, winter, spring and then summer as we move across the screen there uh, from 1900 to, through to um, 2017 and each of those increments represent a 10 millimetre per decade change in, um, in rainfall trends. So I mean it's pretty obvious to see there that if we look at the, the winter and spring rainfall, the two uh, charts on the left hand side. Um, you can see that you know, we're looking around about a zero to 10 millimetre per decade um, trend towards lower rainfall in winter and spring. And conversely, when we look at the summer rainfall on the right hand side, um, across that decade, same decade, we're seeing um, a similar increase of around zero to 10 millimetres per decade in terms of summer rainfall. I guess the other... Um, I guess a uh, white elephant in the room is frost and it is something that we're just having to learn to deal with. Obviously a shift towards um, earlier sowing times, realising that opportunity of sowing early, um, but also just seeing a, a, you know, an increase in incidence of frost events um, across you know, some of the key grain growing regions. So um, I've just taken a simple example there on the top right hand side, and apologies again, the data's a little bit old. but. Taking the example of the number of frost events affecting the flowering wind, but window in Yitpi um, at a single site in Victoria at Longrenong, um, you know, just showing you know, since I guess the late 90s um, through to 2013, 2014, um, we've seen you know, an increase in the number of frost events during that critical flowering window 
um, you know, from, from you know, anywhere from one through to up to eight uh, frost events in that time frame. So, um, and I, I guess uh, this aligns to some of the findings of, of Dr Crimp from CSIRO. Um, his team found the frost window over much of northern Victoria, for example, had lengthened, lengthened considerably in the decade to 2011. Um, and if you look at the risk of uh, experiencing a, a two degrees minimum temperature event, the 10% risk now occurs 46 de days later than any of the previous decades. So um, I think we don't need to talk too much more about that one other than knowing that we need to find a way to, to better mitigate the risks of frost, uh, recognising that there, there won't be a silver bullet, um, but can rest assured that GRDC is certainly focused on uh, looking at new approaches to managing frost moving forward. So that all sounds doom and gloom, but I think you know, it is uh, important to reflect on how far we've come as an industry, and I think last year was a case in point um, with many growers and advisors noting, I guess, how yields were, were uh, frequently exceeded what we expect in terms of water use efficiency or in terms of historic yields and, I guess, similar uh, seasonal conditions. So um, I think it is important that we do reflect on how far we've come, and that is through you know, research development extension as well as um, you know, the, the advice and, and, and the support of, of the, the advisors in the room. But we've come a long way in terms of um, changing our systems and some of the key areas obviously around you know, rate of genetic gain and, and improvements in varieties, um, a better understanding around phenology and flowering windows. Um, you know, I think the key thing is obviously around that recognition of the importance of capture, capture and storage of water. So making every millimetre that drops out of the sky um, convert into into profit. Um, the other points, I guess, general improvements in crop agronomy, so weeds, pest, disease control, um, crop nutrition, particularly around management of nitrogen, although we know we've got a long way to go there, and timeliness. I think just the, the recognition um, with those top 20% of growers in terms of profit that timeliness and systemised patterns of work are absolutely critical, not only in terms of time of sowing, but in terms of the timing of all operations. So it's those one percenters that are making the difference. Um, so all this, I guess, leads to moving forward effectively, though more of the same is not good enough. Um, you know, we need businesses which are more resilient, um, more able to, to deal with, I guess, that climate variability, um, but also to deal with the, the, the I guess, um, macro and microeconomic factors around declining in terms of trade, um, upfront costs, and I guess, at the end of the day, the frequent decisions that growers are making on a daily basis which are having you know, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars impact on the farm business. So it's those risk reward trade-offs um, and trying to, to I guess, manage that, that risk. Um, I guess just, just in terms of what GRDC is doing about it, and I won't spend too much, too much longer on this, but I, I guess we are changing, you've seen the change, and I think it's now around implementation. Um, we've got a new purpose, we've got a new R&D plan. And under that plan, we've got 30 key investment targets, which we're developing strategies for investment around. And the key thing we'll be looking at is critically, what can we do which is different? And what are those transformational opportunities? In some cases, taking high risk, but obviously always calculated risk. Uh, we've got new people, new ways of doing business, and really encourage everyone here to engage with the team, engage with our broader network through panels and regional cropping solutions networks. So while I've got a captive audience and you, you can't escape, um, I did think I would take the opportunity to perhaps highlight a few of GRDC's and just a couple of GRDC's recent investments. Um, and the reason for this is just for you to, to be aware and please reach out to the researchers, to the GRDC staff that are managing these investments, get engaged, have your input and shape the RDE. and um, one of the, the major investments which GRDC has uh, undertaken in recent times is around uh, an investment to increase the production on sandy soils in the low to medium rainfall areas of the GRDC southern region. Um, this project's led by um, Lynn McDonald from CSIRO in conjunction with the University of South Australia, SARDI, Mali Sustainable Farming Systems and Agro. Um, the purpose of this investment is to really look at um, diagnosing the major constraints uh, to crop root growth and uptake of water and nutrients on sandy soils. So that's looking at all the issues associated with those soils around water repellency, water storage, um, nutri nutrition, um, herbicide residues, for example, and persistence in those soils. So a whole range of factors and trying to come up with new solutions to address those. Um, 
this involves both research and validation and in, in also, I, I guess, builds upon a lot of the work that's been done in Western Australia around some more radical um, amelioration techniques um, you know, and everything through to simplistic, more simplistic approaches like deep ripping or delving through to um, you know, placing organic matter and, and other amendments at depth. Um, a key thing here is obviously around economic return though. Um, and how do we treat a whole field scenario, especially in those dune swale systems? So a really big element of this is looking at the economic um, impact and how we would treat, uh, I guess, a field uh, you know, on, a, on a farm scale. Um, just building upon that, I just wanted to also highlight, um, and this is an investment which is concluded. Um, it was led by the CRC for polymers. Um, many of you may or may not be aware of this, but uh, it was looking at identifying new wetting agents um, for um, you know, addressing issues related with around water repellency in non-wetting soils. Um, I think this is just a really good example of a public-private sector partnership um, where there was co-investment between uh, BASF um, you know, with uh, CSIRO, um, the CSC for polymers, GRDC, and the work being led by Swinburne University, uh, supported by the University of New England, UWA, and CSIRO. So um, these, uh, a couple, these wetter technologies, I guess, um, are aimed at improving water infiltration, um, reducing runoff, and increasing water retention. Um, I'm sure um, if there's any BASF representatives or your local agronomists, have a chat to them about... Um, about this technology, but I think a key difference here is recognising the fact that water repellent soils aren't water repellent soils or sands aren't sands, and the fact that we need to actually uh, look at diagnosing um, what, what sort of um, wetting technology may or may not have a positive economic impact in, on an individual site by site basis. So the real difference here is around um, a, a soil test or soil testing technology to actually help to understand the soil and then, um, I guess, diagnose what the most appropriate, appropriate response may or may not be. Um, switching quickly to nutrition, um, there's been a lot of work done in the area of looking at, I guess, better adapted rhizobia strains. So here we're looking at opportunities to increase nitrogen fixation um, in pulse crops, um, obviously with pulses being a critical um, break crop in the rotation. Um, and I guess one of, the, one of the key outputs of this investment is looking to build upon um, previous work around um, identifying better adapted um, rhizobial strains more generally, but specifically looking at um, opportunities for um, rhizobial strains which have greater persistence and greater nitrogen fixation in uh, lower pH soils. Um, look, I think the key thing here is it's about understanding you know, and treating, um, looking at the, at the cause as well as, as the symptoms. So, not suggesting we don't need to continue to do more work around liming and, and looking at um, addressing the root cause, uh, but obviously there are opportunities to try to increase production and also nitrogen fixation through identification of more acid tolerant rhizobial strains. So um, the aim there is to bring those, those strains through to commercialisation. Um, the other piece there is about better understanding, I guess, um, how to uh, maximise the performance of rhizobia under dry sowing conditions. So a lot of questions around how we maximise that performance, um, looking at different products, peat based versus granular products, for example, and also building upon a little bit of work that was done in a, in a previous event investment around what are the implications of some of the crop protection products, if anything, on rhizobial um, survival and ability to, to nodulate and fix, fix nitrogen. So um, looking also at a range of other inoculation practices to try to uh, maximise that, that, that nitrogen fixation benefit. Uh, that project's led by uh, Ross Ballard from SARDI in conjunction with the University of Adelaide. Um, another one I just wanted to touch on briefly was uh, a, a project aimed at optimising crop establishment. Um, I think the title is a little bit misleading there around improving crop establishment density and spacings to maximise yield and profit. This is not about looking at more work on, on uh, plant density, um, seeding rate, row spacing. You know, a lot of that work requires local validations. It's system dependent. What this is really challenging is if we look at those agronomy levers we can pull, should we be questioning, for example, for example the planting configuration within a field? So should we be planting crops in, in rows? or should we be looking at different configurations? Um, the other thing is looking at the opportunity to explore um, the economic benefit or agronomic benefit um, or disadvantages of seed singulation in a winter cropping system. So 
As we all know, um, you know uh, seed singulation or precision planter is a common place in, uh, in summer cropping, particularly for, for corn. Um, you know, is there an opportunity to look at um, uh, how, how those systems might fit or if they even fit in winter cropping systems? With a focus on those crops which have high cost of establishment, so for example hybrid canola, or also looking at crops like faba beans and some of the pulses where um, maybe you know, establishment is particularly critical. Um, this project's led by the University of Adelaide in conjunction with WANFA, uh, the Birchip Cropping Group, Southern Farming Systems and the Northern Sustainable Soils Group. So um, quite a bit of engineering work in this as well, looking at different, different systems, um, but yeah, quite an interesting investment to it, so watch this space. And finally, many in the room might, might glaze over irrigation, but for those, I guess, in, in the southeast of the state as well as um, parts of the Mallee and areas where, I guess, irrigation infrastructure is available, um, there is an opportunity for us to, to do um, more and, and, I guess, lift both pro productivity and profitability under irrigation. Um, this investment, or actually four, uh, a range of four investments across the GRDC's southern and northern region, um, is looking at four major areas. Um, one is actually more of an economic analysis around maximising the dollar return per megalitre of water. Um, so that's looking at that relationship between commodity price, response to irrigation, um, water price and um, crop sequencing, for example. So how do you get best bang for your buck in terms of um, uh, dollars per megalitre of water? Um, there's a big component and a major investment around agronomy. So this is actually recognising that you can't just take high rainfall zone agronomy and apply it to irrigation. Um, it's actually very different when we're wo working in what effectively can be a water non-limiting environment. So um, looking at um, unique um, or tweaking agronomic practices um, to realise the genetic yield potential under irrigated, um, under irrigated uh, grains production. Um, the final bit is around looking at unique um, factors around um, or, or novel approaches to soil amelioration. Um, this, we have a range of, um, I guess, investments in soil amelioration for both, as I mentioned, sandy soils, but also looking at um, hostile subsoils. Um, this is actually looking at those unique um, issues which are experienced under um, irrigated grains production. Uh, for example, if you think about coming out of a rice crop where you're coming out of a, um, you know, a, an anaerobic environment uh, where you've actually got a compacted layer to the issues that, that fate, um, poses moving forward. So really looking at those unique soil types and soil problems in, in irrigation. And all of this is tied together through some facilitated action learning groups to, I guess, make sure we translate those outcomes to growers as well as get that feedback um, in terms of to shape the RDNA program. So just to finish off, I guess, uh, the plug, just while, while you're here over the next couple of days, um, I, I just wanted to note there is a GRDC stand here. Please come up and have a chat to the staff, uh, introduce yourself. Um, there is uh, also a new agronomist and grower starter pack, so anyone that's maybe new to the industry in the last four or five years, uh, come up there and get your goodie bag. There's a whole range of um, ute guides and, and valuable resource materials in there. Um, also, please uh, visit the, the, the SAGI stand. So um, people might say, what, what the heck is SAGI? Um, it's a significant investment by GRDC in a program around statistics um, for the Australian grains industry. Um, it's, uh, so please go and introduce yourself to the staff and, uh, and learn more about that investment. And uh, most of all, make the most out of the next couple of days. So thank you for that. Um, we might move on to...